This webinar is sponsored by my friends at Iron Source. For those of you here, I'm assuming you're pretty serious about growing your games business, which is why Iron Source is the perfect sponsor. These guys are industry leaders for a reason, with their growth experts and tools, such as their ROAS optimizer and in app bidding solution level play, taking care of your game business while you focus on developing the best products. I highly recommend checking them out. I for one wish we used these guys in the early days of next games. Head on over to ironsrc.com to check them out. Hey game developer, are you looking for great new authentic video creatives? Try something totally new with influencer generated content IGC by Opera Event. Influencers and actors will make specific creative content for your games. An Opera event will deliver you high quality video ads that highlight the best parts of your game. Go to getigc.com to see some examples and get more information. That's getigc.com. <laughs> now we can start. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, welcome guys to the panel. Uh, this is going to be fun. We have a lot of topics to cover today. Uh, I would like to start with short introductions. So I'll just briefly tell. Uh, so you, everybody probably knows my background from Elite Game Developers from Next Games. I will leave the floor now to talk with uh, the rest of the panel. Let's start with uh, Anton and Sergey and then Misha and uh, Mikhail. Uh, Miska at the end. Yeah, thanks, Joachim, and thanks for you know organizing all of this, and thank you guys for attending. Um, so yeah, me and Sergey, we both represent Invest Game, uh, which is InvestGame.net. If you wanna put it in your browser, and I don't know if anyone apart from us guys sees the link to the to the news, but anyway. So Invest Game is a new gaming market platform we've started recently, like uh, four months ago. And what we do is uh, we track all public and uh, publicly announced uh, gaming, obviously related investment data in the market, including uh, private placements, M and A's, and public offerings. Um, so if you check the website, there are several ways you can find the info. Well, it's news section cover covering major deals with our initial analysis. Uh, and we can weekly news digest with brief descriptions and uh, some insights on the biggest deals. Um, in addition, we have you know tables and graphs with uh, all the recent investment data as well as league tables covering major strategics and VC funds. So please uh, go to the investgame.net and see that all for yourself. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you here. Uh, again, Joachim, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think I can start with a small background of myself. Uh, so my name is uh, Sergey. Over the last five years, I've been involved uh, in executing the deals around the globe. Uh, back in 2015, I've started my let's say, investment banking career at American Investment Bank called Lincoln International. In 2019, I've uh, joined MGVC Fund, uh, an investment out of my games. And since that time, I'm basically, you know, doing the deals uh, in the gaming sector. Uh, so far, 10 plus deals closed in the fund with the most one uh, that just announced this morning, Deals Crop. Uh, so turning back uh, to, the, to the invest game, I would say that, um, you know, the core philosophy of our platform is to increase the transparency into the market and eventually um, achieve, you know, like, uh, or become one uh, number one platform for tracking investments into the gaming market. Uh, passing on my microphone to Misha. Hey everyone, and uh, Joachim, thanks for, for having me. Pleasure to have this uh, discussion with you guys today. So, so look, so my name is Misha. Uh, I'm part of Arim and Co. We're a technology-focused investment bank and uh, with a lot of uh, experience in, in gaming. Uh, it's a core sort of focus for us. So my background is, is in M&A and investment banking. So I won't uh, in finance, I so won't bother you uh, with that for, for too long. But at the REAM, we are we're 15 people between London and, and San Francisco. And uh, what we do, we advise 
growth stage companies and a lot of gaming studios on uh, M and A, so their their exits. We represent them in conversation with with buyers and also on uh, raising capital, particularly on the on the later stage, the larger rounds. So we uh, have been lucky over the past uh, seven eight years to work on 20 plus, almost 25 uh, deals in uh, in the gaming space, including some very big ones like um, the sale of Supercell to SoftBank, King to Activision, um, Peak to Zynga this year, uh, but also more a lot of more kind of mid-market um, names. And uh, so this year we, uh, we sold companies to, to play Tika, uh, to Steelfront, obviously um, to Zynga, as I said, this year we, we did uh, four deals, including Peak, but also um, Nanobits, which just got closed with, with Steelfront, we sold Stormate uh, early this year, and Colibri uh, to, to Ubisoft out of, out of Germany. So uh, it's, uh, it's a busy market. It's, an, it's a very uh, active uh, M&A landscape. So we're really keen to, to discuss that with you today. Awesome. So I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for having me on, on this panel. Like a lot of heavy hitters here. Uh, I don't have an investment banking background. Uh, and, um, I'm Mishka Katkov, yeah. I've been in games for a dozen years now, uh, ever since graduating from, from business school. Uh, first in product positions here in Helsinki, Finland, starting digital chocolate, then working in more mobile game companies in product roles and game lead roles at Supercell, Rovio, Funplus, and Zynga. Uh, currently, uh, founder of, uh, of a startup myself, so I'm <laughs> I'm on the uh, the early part of, of this this journey. Uh, in addition to that, I've been running uh, started Deconstructor Fund blog maybe nine years ago, so that's one thing. And also, I've been venture partner with with Play Ventures. Currently, uh, entrepreneur in residence for for Play Ventures. So so that's kind of from the uh, the gaming side. Happy to be here. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, I'm going to first, first kick it off with uh, the discussion on the M&A side. I think that's the, where the, the most hot area of gaming has been lately. It's been a crazy year, uh, super good year as well for founders, for investors who have gotten returns for their efforts. So first off, like, like there's big deals this year like the Zynga deal for play, uh, for Peak Games. Uh, there's probably bigger ones coming this year as well, hoping for that. But let, let's let's go to like some data. Uh, Sergey, I'm gonna allow you to share, share the screen here. So you can you can start okay. like showing some data on these topics and, and let's hit it off with uh, Invest Games, uh, both you and, you and Anton going through what you got for us today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do. So do you see the screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. So yeah, we uh, guys have collected some data uh, just for the purpose of this webinar, which is pretty much in line with the report that you will see uh, nowadays on our website or on VentureBeat. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's go through it. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Joachim has mentioned so far, uh, we have 80 plus deals that have been closed during the last nine months uh, with a combined value, I would say over 15 billion so far, including of course, uh, uh, Zenimax uh, acquisition uh, by Microsoft and uh, Big Game Zynga, which I would say in total account for roughly 60% of their overall total deal value. And uh, we actually think that looking at the data and uh, analyzing it, that the current macroeconomic environment probably largely unaffected the M&A activity uh, throughout this year and might even have increased the M&A appetite from the buyers, uh, or which are largely publicly uh, traded gaming companies, uh, given the recent increase in the share prices and trading multiples that we all have seen. So I would say almost each deal uh, has become uh, immediately accretive even at the announcement. Yeah. So, uh, um, uh, so yeah. Is, uh, is it the next slide, Sergey? No, no, no. Uh, I think that uh, we might we might still uh, uh, say about a few words about M&A games. So, uh, so far, uh, the most active buyers um, in 2015 were, of course, uh, Tencent, uh, a usual 
kind of guy, suspect. Uh, then I would say an interesting, uh, um, I'd say an interesting uh, kind of things that happened with the Embracer group when they announced several deals uh, at just one day, and <laughs> everybody has seen it, like a huge increase in the M&A activity uh, throughout this year by Embracer. And then uh, moving on to the Steelfront group, which was actually uh, quite active acquire this year, acquiring Stormate, uh, and then recently announced uh, Nanobit. And um, I think that Zynga has also joined the game uh, with the big games and Rolic after a long year of silence from the mergers and acquisitions. Uh, what are your thoughts, Misha? Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's, it's a great summary and it's a, it's a busy year uh, for M&A. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting reasons behind that. But I think if you just take a, a step back here and think of like how this industry has evolved, I mean, just it has always been um, like growing through M&A and consolidating. And if you look at how, you know, Take-Two and EA and Activision have been, have been built over the last decades, they are, you know, just... Uh, dozens of, of acquisitions uh, over the years. So this is how, I mean, talking about the kind of the console world, um, this is how as a, as a sector uh, it, it has evolved. So uh, another thing is, again, like stepping back is in gaming, um, comparing to some other other sectors, uh, sort of non-technology, non-gaming, M&A is difficult. Like it's, it is a big challenge to, you know, buy a company, you integrate it, you have culture, real issues sometimes. So uh, it's, it's not always uh, successful. You have like studies saying, you know, 70% are kind of mixed results, etc. So it is, it is tough. In gaming, it can be tough as well, but you have just a lot of uh, examples and, and track record of uh, the, the big kind of majors today and, and now gay, gay guys in, uh, in gaming who um, have just been very successful at, uh, at, at growing uh, this way. And um, we talk about console, etc. But in mobile, I think the recent examples of, of Peak and, and Steelfront uh, building this uh, kind of families of studios, um, the citizen city of, uh, uh, of independent companies that uh, fairly independent who uh, who run their own thing, etc. But are part of, of the same group has created a lot of value. So this is definitely uh, a, a kind of a, a, a background for uh, for the activity. Now, if you look at the data that uh, Sergey and Anton, you, you guys are showing, I think you have, um, in terms of like larger deals, the, the ones you have, you have logos off at the top here and maybe some others, you probably, I think in total, you can probably count close to 20 um, like meaningful, significant deals uh, versus uh, um, probably a handful, uh, tw 20 this year but only a few in 2019 and maybe around 10 sort of the years before. So there is an acceleration uh, for sure. You have, you have more, uh, more, more activity. And if I had to summarize like the reasons, some of the, the drivers for, for the current uh, state, um, I think how, at least how for two thirds of the deals are, are in mobile. So mobile is the largest sort of chunk of the, the overall industry and, and is, uh, starting to, to mature. So I think in earlier years, you had people who were just focused on their own growth and uh, mm -hmm. the, a lot of the white space they had to grow. Uh, now you have a few uh, larger players emerging and uh, kind of leading the market and, um, and they are keen to, uh, to acquire. So a few, a few number of, of large platforms. Um, for independent studios, uh, it is obviously a bit more difficult than, I mean, the, if you took on top 100 top grossing, uh, it's a lot of the same name. So breaking into that is, is, is not that easy. So uh, having the support of, uh, of a larger uh, platform is, uh, can, make a, can make a difference. Um, and, uh, and the last one, yeah, fundamentally, like to have a, uh, an active market, you need to, to have hungry buyers. And the buyers here uh, are, are particularly uh, active. I think they, um, they all feel uh, really good about their own businesses. Uh, they have sort of benefited from from covid in in a sense of uh, you have their own have uh, higher stronger growth this year uh, they um, have access to a lot of capital uh, should be like uh, zynga or uh, or storm or, or steel front or, or others are just uh, have, have a lot of public investors very um, hungry to deploy capital in into gaming and have exposure to the sector so they can finance those deals uh, they're valued very highly i think it's 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 crazy but um I think you know companies like Take Two have, have grown by like 70% over the last few months. 
and even very large ones like uh, if you take um, you know Nexon or Netmarble, those are like big companies. Like uh, I think uh, uh, Nexon went from sort of 10, 12 billion of, mm -hmm. of mark, market cap in, in January to, to the double. So the, a lot of them have, have doubled, their value is very high. So they're also keen to use their uh, stock as, um, as a currency uh, to buy companies. And you have, you have dots here uh, bought by Take-Two uh, recently. I mean, that's a, that's a deal which has a, a significant say portion paid in, um, in stock. Mm -hmm. Let's say if we speak about some, I would say particular guys, like particular acquirers uh, in the European market. Like like the like the steel front, uh, which is actually you know the dark horse of uh, gaming market, uh, that that I think uh, was initially built from the very scratch uh, using the uh, MNA machine, uh, which is a very interesting deal. What, what are your thoughts on that regarding the kind of the what they're trying to build and uh, what is the what is the idea behind making such you know like huge acquisitions year over year and being so active uh, over 2019 2020. Uh, mission. Yeah, look, so Steelfront is uh, is incredible, and I, I can remember this company. We were on on the good game deal. Uh, it was it was kind of seventy million ish of of market cap of uh, market cap back then, and they reversed merged in into good game essentially, and and that transformed the business and it has um, really um, delivered and uh, really strongly since since then. Um, and executed super well. So, so their vision of building this sort of almost index tracker of you know diversified portfolio companies uh, across across genres in in mobile, but not only uh, is, uh, is is really impressive. But um, I think you have different a couple of different strategies in in the market and uh, uh, in in addition to guys like Silfront who have been super super acquisitive. So. I think if I just have to give a few examples of what we're seeing right now, uh, you have people who are planning to, to IPO, maybe we'll, we'll talk about that later separately, but who are, mm -hmm. are keen to, to buy uh, studios and, and sort of beef up their equity story and diversify and have, have several games in their portfolio and uh, before they, they go public. Um, you have uh, uh, people who are looking for uh, really big assets only, things who, that can really move the needle for them, sort of the, the, the Zynga's forever franchise model of, okay, this is a product that can, you know, bring 100 million plus uh, to the top line. Um, others are more into kind of diverse portfolios that are probably both uh, kind of um, have, have a different, different risk profile. Um, we see, I think uh, you mentioned European players uh, just now, and uh, I think it's, it's super global as a, uh, as a market and uh, studios come from anywhere and acquisitions also, and uh, people are sometimes keen to, you know, buy something in a, in a new geography to build a, a new hub. Um, people spending a lot of time in Eastern Europe, for example, these days, uh, probably fewer keen to go and buy like 100% U.S studios and, and uh, actually keen to, to go more into kind of some of the lower cost uh, geographies. Um, and uh, yeah, speaking of, of costs, uh, you have, I think, two approaches here. Uh, you have people who are very focused on, on margins and profitable studios. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are kind of the public guys who have guided their own investors and the, and the market on, okay, we focus on, you know, uh, things that are 20% EBITDA plus. Um, while others, uh, particularly the, the private ones who don't have to report quarterly to the market, can be uh, a bit more uh, creative here and, and not only buy, you know, a company for its current uh, profitability, but really see, okay, in the unit economics, in the trajectory, um, this is a, uh, a product that needs to scale and it doesn't need to be yeah. highly profitable today, but it will be tomorrow. So they're buying, uh, they're valuing on, uh, tomorrow's mm -hmm. margin. Yeah, let's say if we speak about the particular examples, I know that you cannot comment on uh, on everything since you are pretty much involved in a, in a very large, you know, almost each large deals. But nevertheless, I try. Uh, so let's say if we're speaking about the Zynga, yes, recent acquisitions with the big games. What it mostly like what you've mentioned, like trying to acquire the EBITDA. So was it pure acquisition of the EBITDA, or was it more like a, I don't know, like a move? Or, uh, more towards the, the casual segment where they already presented, but just have a, you know, like a largely increase the scale and audience over there. What, what yeah, can you say? About look, I think the other aspect here is the kind of scarcity value of, of certain assets, right? So 
uh, it's difficult to break into the, the top growing games. It's difficult to be uh, a very large company in, in there. So it's, it's, there's a few uh, rare assets that are kind of uh, highly <laughs> sought after. And, uh, and obviously, uh, Peak was one. And with Zynga, they had a strong previous relationship because they already sold their uh, a smaller part of that business, the board and card games in 2017, mm -hmm. I think. Um, to them, uh, so they knew each other was a natural fit. They already were in, um, in Turkey through, through Gram. Uh, so, and obviously it makes sense, as you said, financially uh, to uh, kind of combine the two and be, grow and be, and, and be bigger. And uh, so uh, I don't think there is a like, hey, this is revenue or profits. It's, it's, it's a bit of everything, but it's above all, I think it's, uh, this is a rare asset. And when you have the opportunity to, uh, um, to, to, to do that kind of deal, transformative deal, uh, people get uh, to, move, uh, to move quickly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, speaking about, I think, this uh, two kind of, uh, I think one of the dark horse, uh, that is why all the graphs are black, uh, the steel front, uh, what kind of strategy do they try to execute here? Like, you know, acquiring, because, uh, you know, from very first time when I've looked at the steel front and the ideas that came up from me is like, what is that kind of the MNO MNO strategy that they're using when they're trying to build this, uh, I would say the powerhouse, the mobile powerhouse uh, of free to play games. Uh, it, it seems like each, each year they're trying to acquire someone new to get revenue increased, or it's more like also organic and uh, this MA strategy. I think steel front has been built as, an, as a kind of, with m a at the core of, of its strategy uh, so it's, uh, it's a big uh, focus for, uh, for, for for Jorgen I think Joachim you interviewed him recently and he, he talked about that so he's very involved in, in that and obviously has a great team uh, with, with Marina um, driving those so they're yeah very actively looking at looking at everything and um, I, I I think yes, uh, this uh, this family of uh, I think he calls it a family of, of studios uh, uh, that uh, are uh, fairly independent, can run their own things, are kind of responsible for their own PLs, uh, but can also benefit from a lot of the, the know-how and kind of central services and, and better mm -hmm. deals on things uh, works really well. I think a key thing here to understand is the. Um, uh, the way the, those deals are structured, uh, which comes with. Essentially, you have, you know, some, well, people get, get some cash up front and sometimes you have external investors that you, you need to kind of reward for their uh, part of the journey. Um, you have um, a stock in, in steel front. I think that's, that's key, you know, for some of, of those uh, people you have here have obviously benefited really well from uh, the growth in, in the stock. So getting that exposure to this broader portfolio, which is actually more diversified than just your own game, is, I think is great. And then um, uh, deals often typically have a, a more of a kind of earn out or stepped acquisition portion, uh, which aligns the founders, the management team with the, the buyer because you have to execute uh, on your plan and grow your game bigger. And it can, it can be a, a great outcome if, if you okay. do so. So you're influencing, you, you have your own earn out that uh, is, is a kind of, well, let's say cash payout, but you also will, by doing really well, you'll influence the stock price and get to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So if I can jump in here, um, I wanted to kind of take a little bit of a step back and look at different um, sort of models that, that I'm, so even a bigger step back. So we looked at all these graphs, all these games that have been analyzed and, and on the Extractor of Fun, Eric Sulford and I did an analysis of the different M&A models in mobile gaming. And I'm curious to kind of go through these different models that, that we're seeing based on all these deals done and to hear kind of like Misha and, and you guys, um, what, what do you think? Are we totally off? Because naturally we're not running the deals. We're kind of looking at them from the side and, and evaluating uh, what, is, what is the strategy behind them. So the way we categorize this is we're broken down into kind of two different approach. Number one is exploiting synergy. Uh, and number two is buying scale. And then each of these different approaches has different models. So if we look at exploiting synergy, the sort of a basic model that, that we're seeing is the audience arbitrage, where a company acquires a studio with an under monetized or under engaged audience for a purpose of using its own internal analytics, products development, live operation, user acquisition systems to increase the acquisition property value. As in a good example, I think AppLovin has, has 
probably mastered this type of approach where they're almost basically vertical integrating uh, and creating a portfolio of different games that are actually have synergy between each other and naturally ha having a mediation platform as, as in, in the background and all their abilities, they're able to help out these studios that they acquire to grow significantly. And if we look at some of the key acquisitions, that would be, for example, Belka uh, from uh, a studio from Belarus that quickly after an acquisition by Applovin, uh, pretty much skyrocketing in, in, into top 100 grossing and is, is doing phenomenally well. And actually, I think they're just launching a solitaire game at the moment. So in these type of audience arbitrage strategies, the, uh, the due diligence really focus on the, uh, the organic and paid growth rate and figuring mm -hmm. out if the company is able to acquire users profitably at any level of scale and looking at if the game is growing mostly organically uh, because, uh, because at that point you have to evaluate how much value you can bring as a company and how much you can scale after this uh, underdeveloped in some way company gets the hands on your resources. Mm -hmm. And the success factors is really integrating the company into the parent company infrastructure. And, and as an example, like you've mentioned Playtica, they've done a lot of acquisitions and, and this is anecdotally some kind of a elements they're looking in, in their due diligence because Playtica is a very numbers driven organization, uh, very analytical. They would most likely have challenges and cultures that are very um, creative and, and not as numbers driven of, as they are. So, so there are definitely, even, even if you leave this sort of acquisition to kind of uh, in a city state model, they still have to have that same type of, of a culture of, of product mm -hmm. development and, and business approach. If we speak about this, sorry to jump in audience. Are yeah, jump, please jump in after if through each one, that's much easier. Mm -hmm. Does it include the cross-selling opportunities? I mean, like the recent acquisition that uh, actually Pig, uh, Pig has, uh, so uh, Zynga has done with the Rolex. So uh, they have stepped in into the hyper casual market, which uh, you know like wasn't uh, their I would say core yeah. business. And uh, what do you think about this? Is it like so? Uh, that, that's that's a very good that's very good question. So uh, my personal opinion is that that the uh, the acquisition of Rolex is actually not as much about cross promotion because cross promotion to achieve good cross promotion from hyper casual game to different type of games is much more difficult than for example, Apple have an acquisition of, I believe it was people fun and then Belka because you know that the word games provide extremely good audience for puzzle games. And that is the more of a cross promotion acquisition in that sense. Uh, with, with, with the Rolex acquisition, I think the, uh, the approach is more of, IDFA is coming. A lot of things are going to change. The targeting becomes much more difficult. But that type of approach, that the, the changes in IDFA presumably will not have as big of an impact on hyper-casual games that use very broad um, approach. Um, so I, I don't know how much value I would put in on, on the um, IDFA, IDFV um, in, in the Rolex acquisition rather than just saying that it is it's 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 a successful business. It's it's profitable business, and it's li likely not to be as much impacted by the um, by the IDFA. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it it would be really hard to prove that that those hundreds of millions of I don't know, Rolex probably gets 150 million installs per quarter. That that they are uh, that easily cross promotable to the vast portfolio of Zing games. If they've proven that, that then, then that's mm -hmm. even, even a bigger um, acquisition. Yeah, I, I agree. I think people have been predicting the end of hyper casual for <laughs> forever since 18 and 19 and every quarter someone would say, oh, this is the end of it. And you just look at like the cumulative downloads installs of like the top, let's say like five, 10 guys in hyper casual last month, it was the highest ever. <laughs> So uh, it's it's working, and uh, yeah, for for some it's important to have exposure to that to that ad monetized. And yeah, I think there is uncertainty uh, from from IDFA, but as Mishka you just said, uh, because of the the kind of very broad audience, uh, it it might be actually shielded from some of some of the impact. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if we if we look at the uh, the second sort of a model when it comes to finding synergy, so if, if the first one is the audience arbitrage, the second one is development expertise. And that means basically acquiring a studio that specializes in some, some sort of a, a genre. And, um, and that genre is something that the, uh, the parent company doesn't have expertise in. And of course, uh, probably Scopely is one of the best examples of, of acquiring of development expertise. They find a lot of these studios that are maybe not the, uh, the strongest in their, in their genre, except Fox Next. And, uh, and they're able to bring in 
high valued IP as, as a bigger entity, grab those big IPs like Star Trek and, and Looney Tunes and so forth and bring it to these uh, developers that actually have the capabilities to make these type of games, more and more deeper games. So in these type of a due diligence, it's, the, uh, it's really the company's success depends on a, on a handful of, like you have to find if it's a handful of, of key employees that are really running this. And you have to, of course, uh, do a really good due diligence and analyze the market and see how big is the market, whether it's, you know, RPGs or other RPGs kind of predict how the market is evolving. And if, if you're really... Uh, should be investing in a studio that makes these type of games. And also you should be looking at, uh, you know, how old the, the successful games in the studios are and can those games co- kind of be replicated in the current market. So if, if as an example, uh, the machine zone acquisition that Uploven did, um, you could arguably say that apart from the latest sort of RPG game that machine zone did, it's older um, 4X games were old compared to, what was current? What is currently trending in the market? Games like um, Rise of Kingdoms and so forth. So, so you're trying to understand mm-hmm. how modern is the infrastructure. If it's modern, if those games are not too old, then that means they can, they can probably make a modern game. But if the games that they've made are five, six, seven years old and nothing has been done since then, um, like Social Point, for example, in their breeding games, um, if the market has evolved past it, it's it might be not as good of a, a good of acquisition. So in these type of a uh, acquiring of development expertise, you're really looking at things like culture. So can you, can they operate after you, you know, after you acquire them? Will, will things change too much? Uh, you're looking at the attrition because, you know, the company doesn't make games, people make games. And if you acquire a company, especially the studio that is, that is pretty small and, and focused on development, some key talent may, li- may, may leave pretty quickly because they're not seeing the upside anymore. And, and that will kind of demolish the whole idea behind acquiring the development expertise. And finally, of course, you're always looking at the overlap. So what are the synergies between your parent company or the acquirer and acquiree? And, um, and can those bring value? And in that case, you're looking at the cross-targeting and cross-promotion. Uh, cross-targeting, probably something that, that in case of AppLove and that has this mediation uh, platform, um, they're able to yeah, they're able to move a little bit faster on the, on the marketing side as well. So guys, any, any input on, on this type of model? So these are just invented, like th- this is not the truth. I'm, I'm just <laughs> observing. No, I think oh. it's a great, it's a great taxonomy. And uh, as you said, like the team and incentivizing the team uh, as part of the, the deal and making sure they're aligned, like is, is key on, on all those transactions. But uh, particularly when it's about the genre, the talent, where it's something very unique being built, uh, finding the right structure that works, that rewards people uh, and, and gives them the right sort of level of uh, freedom is, is, is critical. Yeah, it, it feels like the, the more mature the acquiring target is, the more things will be considered regarding like, can, we, can the acquirer get a return on this transaction uh, down the line? So it's like, if you only... You know, if it's a company that hasn't existed for more than 24 months, there's less to consider. It's it's a team and it's a product that's working, uh, which might, might have been the, the case with small giant. But then you get into the territory of peak where you have a company that's been around for 10 years, big hand count, more culture in the background. So I, I think all of that really makes sense into consideration. It, it's never, you can never really ask, so why did they acquire mm-hmm. this company? Well, it's a hundred different reasons. Like, of course, of course. And, and these are like, you're always looking for overlap with different things. But um, I would say, you know, looking at all, all these cases, you can make a case that there's always leading reasons why you're acquiring certain things. And, mm-hmm. and in the PR uh, it's quite often to explain it in, in very different ways. And, and also when I look at the analysis of like Stillfront, for example, and especially uh, some of the stuff that, that Joachim, you have been writing and, and Master of the Meta have been writing, kind of going deeper of like, why? Why did they acquire? And kind of explaining the success behind it, where in fact, it could be a little bit more easier to understand uh, by just saying, well, it's EBITDA. <laughs> so I mean... Um, any, anyway, so, so the, 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 uh, the, the sort of a third approach when, when you're looking for synergies is something 
uh, that we called um, early stage bests or strategic investments like they're usually called. And that's when a, when a larger company acquires a small early stage company with promise of the purpose of capturing possible future value creation. And of course, Supercell as well as Riot are probably um, the best examples of, of companies that do these quite small for their scale strategic investments where they just acquire uh, the majority of, of these small companies. And when you're doing due diligence, it's, it's a little bit like, like VC. So you kind of look at, you know, does the team have experience in launching and running free-to-play games? Is the team focused on large to total addressable market? Are they equipped to win in the subgenre that they're going in? Are the co-founders all aligned on the type of games that they want to build? And are the co-founders like, are they, are they aligned in joining this larger company and, and having the aspiration to scale up and why it works for companies like Supercell and Riot is because they're, they're sort of, um, they're, they're really high on the totem pole of the company. So when they come into these, these early startups, they are happy to join them. They feel still that they're on this, they're on their own journey, but now they have like a big brother and, and they're excited about it. So that might not work to majority of the companies that don't have the same type of, um, uh, status uh, uh, with with game developers, and when you're considering these type of acquisition success factors, you know the number one is of course retention, and that is can you retain all the key employees and transition them into this larger entity, and the retention comes in the form of, you know what's the upside? That's that's kind of a, like a like a big question because now the acquirer might take a little a big portion of the upside, and and what are they looking for out to get out of it. So it's really easy to understand your upside and all the possibilities when, when you have VCs, but when you already have been sort of acquired at an early stage, like what is the, uh, what, what's the next stage? You're not, you know, if, if, if Riot makes the strategic investment, you're, you're not at Riot. You're like a satellite of, of Riot kind of, they've invested into you, but like what, what, what's, what's next from here? Like what happens if you succeed? So if that is not clearly communicated inside the company, uh, that might hurt the retention a little bit because you're kind of in the startup, but not really in the startup. And yeah. the second part is execution. And, you know, can you keep the acquired company focused uh, on a medium and long term? And again, when you're a scrappy startup, you always see the, uh, the bottom of your, of your bank account. Uh, you're, you're trying to do things in a smart and fast way. But if you get earlier, you know, validated by, by one of these extremely amazing companies, uh, you're kind of, you, you can chill, chill back a little bit because you're like, hey, you know, Riot or Supercell, they trust, they trust in what we're doing. Uh, they got our back. So let's, you know, let's not focus, let's now focus on, on execution, bringing the, you know, the, the things that we need to bring, bringing along all the people and so forth versus um, good enough, fat, just let's, let's move fast. Let's, let's make good enough stuff. Let's get some early indications. Let's be scrappy. Let's show that, that we're, we're, we're getting ahead and every day is, you know, sink or swim. So that, those are the kind of the things to, to think about when considering the success of the acquisition. But let's go to, to the next topic. There's the, the investment part that we definitely want to cover yeah. is in fundraising activities. So we, we've seen sort of like this big emergence of uh, this kind of like first generation of gaming investors in the VC side where you have London Venture Partners was the first. Then we've had a lot of people come in, Play Ventures, Transcend Fund, uh, Galaxy. There's Bitcraft, like big, big bunch of people who are now writing checks uh, who know gaming. Uh, and then... Like another aspect that I personally am looking forward to is seeing these companies stay independent for a bit longer to, to have more billion dollar gaming companies come up. I think this is something that uh, will eventually happen. So, but like, let's look at the data, like uh, Anton and Sergey, you guys put together some data on the deals on the VC side. Just uh, show the slides, Sergey. Yeah, yeah. do you see it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all good. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, as you may see by this graph, we've seen that uh, the private investment activity has noticeably dropped in the wake of you know COVID-19 in May 2020. But it gradually recovers afterwards, both in terms of the number of deals and in terms of combined value with around 70 deals closed in early stage, which means, you know, seed in Series A. Uh, and um, 
The, key, the peculiar thing here is that while American companies take dominant positions in the investment activity, um, they comprise somewhat 90 plus percent of value. At the latest HVC and corporate rounds, only 30% of early stage VC funds have been raised by US startups. Um, and in terms of the deal activity, the most active players on this market are currently Play Ventures. So that's probably the next slide already. But anyway, uh, Play Ventures and Galaxy EOS VC and Bitcraft Ventures and CISA Game Ventures and Makers Fund. Uh, all of them altogether account for 54 deals, which is 51% of the total uh, so far in the 2020. Yeah, I would say an interesting trend that occurred this year is that a lot of funds uh, also recently announced that they're putting more money into the gaming, like, uh, I don't know, like the, uh, the examples that we have this year, we games with uh, 30 million, then uh, Grecian Robotics also, uh, has widened the focus and also included the gaming, March gaming capital uh, and free work has also raised funds. So I think that uh, we can say that overall the capital inflow into the gaming industry at the early stage has also substantially increased. And right now we see more and more, I would say gaming focused funds that, that actually do that kind of the analysis that uh, Mishka has, uh, has just done and they, they, that they found something more when putting their money into the, into the studios than just, just uh, pure money, I would say. Mishka, I'm curious about your views on this because you're as a kind of part-time VC. What are, what are you say, seeing at you guys at, at, at play in terms of is this getting a lot more competitive? Do you see a lot more deals? Like how how's the temperature? Yeah, so uh, since I'm not in day to day, I'm I'm more looking at from uh, from a perspective of somebody who's uh, who's about to start raising for a seed fund, and I would say yes, yeah, yeah. Things are, things are more competitive due to the fact that a lot of so-called generalist funds are showing a lot of interest towards games. So what that means is that the, uh, the sort of a gaming focused funds, uh, they are even more active and they're coming in earlier and earlier and starting these discussions with, with potential um, companies earlier to get, to get kind of ahead. And, and um, it also has in a way, um, in a good way, kind of put the gaming focused VCs in a position where they are showing truly the value that they can bring when we're talking about pre-seed and seed, because at mm -hmm. that point, you're really trying to find investors that are not going to give you the highest valuation that are maybe not going to give, well, that's, you know, giving you the most money, but that are going to give you the tools and the expertise that will help you to get to that stage of growth. Mm -hmm. And let's say uh, what, what we observed also is that we might separate, I would say all funds into the seed, pre-seed stage, some doing series A, but usually follow uh, some previous fund. And then you get later stage like KKR um, and I don't know, like uh, also other guys like Anderson Horowitz. Yes. Uh, whether we can say that in the gaming, you generally just have a very seed, I would say early stage fund. And then you have just later one, which scale, you know, the companies like Epic Games, like Scopely, or you have something in the middle as in other industries. What, what are your thoughts on that? Like, why do we observe such huge gap between, I would say, seed, series A, and then you just have a very huge rounds without any kind of, you know, like typical VC game and you have series B, series C, et cetera. I, uh, I'll throw my ideas on that. I think it's, it's so much about like scaling your user acquisition efforts for like what's happening after the A round is you don't really necessarily want to dilute your, your ownership in the company to, to run a UA game. So there's other financial instruments for that purpose. And then when it's more about like, hey, we've, we've achieved a plateau, let's start thinking about like, how do we fund the next, next things that we're going to be doing to build a, even a bigger company, which usually isn't then about UA, but it's more about like taking risk regarding M&A, hiring, whatnot. I think Scopely is in that stage in a sense. Yeah, I think that that's right. There is something about just the, the nature of the industry where you have a game, or you have a product that works. And first, as Joachim, as you said, you can find other instruments, UA financing and kind of more debt-like things to, uh, well, because it's, it's a proven machine. Uh, so you don't, might not need to go to, uh, to investors to, for, for those rounds. So when it works, you very quickly, you, you turn into a, a profitable company. You don't need those 
B, B plus C rounds as you would if you were building like a software company, which would be like unprofitable typically until much later. Um, so what we observe is for the larger bonds, um, and, and actually a lot of those companies because of, of how this works are, are bootstrapped or fully founder owned or have just actually fewer external investors putting pressure on them until much later uh, in, in their life cycle. So uh, some of those larger rounds are um, driven by kind of secondary, uh, you know, getting a bit of the money off of the table or rewarding some early employees. Uh, that's uh, what uh, well, Supercell did back in, back in the days or Moonactive did more recently. Um, what is um, um, happening here is also, uh, you, you, Sergey mentioned KKR and other like private equity is, actually, is really entering the space. Like it, uh, uh, it used to be something they wouldn't look at, at it that, that much. Some had mixed results, perceiving it as like super hit driven, etc. cetera. Uh, now, um, mm -hmm. all like general, even general, very generalist uh, private equity firms uh, see how, how much of a mainstream uh, uh, industry this is, uh, how games as a service are uh, very predictable and, and enter this. So all, a few of those have placed bets, uh, more, some have come from the kind of ad side, um, TVC with Iron Source, KKR with Aplovin, I mean, then building more, more diversified businesses, but uh, clearly you have across all asset classes, uh, investors keen to to deploy uh, in, into the industry. And some have like a more of a approach of, hey, let's take a bet on, uh, you know, the infrastructure, like the soft gaming software or um, the platforms. Uh, but, uh, but there is, we, we, we used to hear people saying, okay, I don't do games because uh, this is, we don't hear that uh, much mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, regarding later stage VC activity, Anton, could you jump in? Yeah, sure. So uh, as you may see again from the graph, we've uh, you know prepared for the latest stage. During the first three quarters of 2020, we see that only three transactions account for 78% of total, total capital injection. Well, uh, as have been already discussed, the first being California-based mobile game publisher Scopely, uh, raising $200 million dollars at 1.7 billion valuation with market rumors about raising additional funds later this year for three billion dollar valuation the second one being california based cross platform uh you know game developer roblox raising 150 million dollars in series g funding round at four billion dollars valuation and you know uh with the news of the ipo next year at eight billion dollar valuation and finally, American game developer, publisher, and distributor Epic Games obviously raised $1.78 billion at $17.3 billion valuation with lead investors, as Sergey has said, KKR, Sony, and Smash Ventures. Yeah, an interesting thing about the Epic Games, I think that everybody is speaking <laughs> about this company nowadays, is that just before they announced this... Uh, Let's call it in the brackets, the VAR <laughs> with Apple and with the platform regarding the commission stores, they raised uh, such huge amount of money. <laughs> Do you guys think that they know what they're doing <laughs> just before announcing all of the uh, stuff, you know, that is happening uh, nowadays? Me that would be just interesting. Strong, to, uh, you've got strong own. opinions about uh, Team Sweeney, et cetera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do they know what they're doing? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I it, mean, it, like, uh, it, it really yes, seems so. like it. It's, it seems like yeah. uh, they, you know, especially Tim has such a strong vision uh, for a CEO and, and the communication has clearly shifted from, from kind of like other people in, in Epic talking to, to mainly Tim driving it. And he's super hands-on, like we've seen emails being sent to Tim Cook and stuff like that. So, so I think he really knows what's, what he wants to achieve. And, and um, it's, it's very interesting to, to watch um, a CEO of a games company have sort of, sort of a, um, it's not altruistic target, but it is a, it's, it's very different. It's very different than the typical one of, of, you know, whether it's IPO or just grow to a massive scale and, and dominate the business, but, but the sort of like a metaverse approach and, and an ability to, to transform the business. I, I think they very like he and, and the Epic very much know what they're doing and, 
and um, it's a it's a lofty target that they've set. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's a unique, uh, it's an incredible company and a, and a unique CEO and a, and a visionary, uh, which is very unique in the space. So uh, they've got uh, um, a, a big war chest, so they can uh, afford big big fights like that for uh, kind of the uh, as you said, well, not exactly altruistic targets, but but something well, that will change the industry for for everyone. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's almost hard to say. Like, who yeah, would, who say would be people. more visionary CEO of of you know that magnitude uh, than 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 Sweeney? Like that that would be that would be the question because you know all the other CEOs are, are quite conservative in the end. They they're executing the strategy, and the strategy is smart. It's it's proven. It's numbers driven and so forth. And and they're working around it. But but you know Tim is really trying to kind of re- revolutionize the market truly. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to jump now into to kind of like, before we end this panel, talk a bit about the future predictions from, from everyone. So I'll, I'll just jump in and, and point out what I'm seeing here. So I, I think there's a lot of activity, but the short term, there will be failures as well, which will be sudden and it will be pulling sort of people back away from the gaming again. Like there's a lot of MMOs, these uh, UGC worlds that are, just getting launched and developed. The development usually takes, you know, years to get them into critical mass. And that will be, it might be a surprise and a, and a bad surprise for, for many founders and VCs as well at how much type, time it's going to take versus like getting things really like hockey stick immediately. So, so that's, that's sort of like something that we need to go through probably. And then all the new, you acquisition targets i think there's there's going to be a lot of new companies that like this morning's news regarding the the company that was acquired uh, that that was a a one year old company i believe uh, where where this it doesn't really require 5 to 10 years for a company to be mature enough to be acquired you can have one hit game and 24 months you're acquired so in a sense there there is going to be more targets out there for sure uh, in in the the following years as well, where the deal sizes won't you know be lower than what we've been seeing this year, I think. Okay, um, so if you're asking me my predictions, I would I would give a few ones. So one that I've been talking a lot about is dichotomy of the market, and a lot of the times like we try to showcase one type of approach and say like, well, this is the trend, but in fact, on, on mobile games, what, what's happening is everything is growing. Um, you know, at the same time. So we see hyper casual games growing at the same time with AAA games, like like the latest one coming in from China. I, I, I forgot the name. Um, it Everything is growing at the same time. So that means there's more investment opportunities. There, there's not the right way to win. There, there are teams that take a long time and they make a big game and that might be successful. And there are teams that might take a week and, and they ship something successful. They get acquired inside a year and that might be a big win. Um, IDFA is going to be... Um, uh, a big, um, it's going to have a big impact. I, I don't know if it's going to have a big impact from the get go, but over time, that impact will especially uh, cause games that are very whale driven to suffer. Um, what IDFA will also probably, lev- you know, IP games will be games with an IP will be more important going forward with with the IDFA depreciation because they have a certain audience, they have a lower CPI, they, they target a, a wider audience. And that is likely why IPs will be more valued in, in mobile games. I think also that the growth driven by these streaming platforms, as well as influencers will become more and more important. We've seen this. And, and as we, so in regards of certain games that are very, um, maybe more mid core, hardcore, because it's more difficult to acquire them using traditional methods, there will be other methods and those methods will be around the streaming and influencers. We've been seeing this happening already uh, through Twitch uh, with, with of course, PC games like Escape from Tarkov, having great success uh, mm-hmm. as, as an extremely niche game on a PC. I expect that, I expect that this type of uh, scenarios will start happening on, on mobile as well. And finally, I would say that IDFV, so the, uh, the sort of a importance of a large audience will drive m and um, I don't know if, you know, we talked about rolling before, even though that might not have been the, uh, the primary cause, 
I think it's a, it's a nice secondary reason uh, to, to prepare for IDFA depreciation, just to have a bigger visibility and almost like your own um, acquisition platform or mediation platform. So what do you think, Misha? Yeah, I think on the, on the IDFA point, and obviously there's a lot of uncertainty there, and I, I know you, you guys have been kind of predicting more M&A from, from it. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree to that. I think it might actually slow things down a little bit while people are trying to figure out what is really happening and how they can something they, some uh, would say, some studios out there would say, okay, we actually have like the best BI. We, we, we'll, um, we, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, uh, we'll navigate it. Uh, I think in, in gaming, particularly when company, when uh, you get some kind of headwinds uh, in your business and uh, maybe you, you, like, you, you're slowing down a bit, you wouldn't, uh, you will actually, you're more likely to retrench a little bit and trying to, to solve this and figure it out and not be out there kind of talking to, to buyers, uh, mainly because a lot of those guys are kind of already profitable. They might be le- less profitable, but they would still uh, kind of survive this and just um, wait this kind of through 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 the storm uh, versus you know in other uh, sectors where you have VC funding you might be running uh, low on cash etc. So I think it's um, uh, well, speaking of of, of Rolik, this vision of hey you can buy your players one by one with like performance marketing or you can buy a big batch of DAUs millions of DAUs with one big M&A deal is uh, yeah is it can be a strategy. Uh, We'll, we'll see how it happens, but there's, uh, I think for, from the target side, uh, the, the independent guys will probably try to see, well, wait to see their, what their options are. Yeah. Well, from, from our point of view, I think that uh, if the market will continue to be strong, because we have like right now US president election, uh, we have some uh, COVID uh, you know, stuff growing again in multiple countries, which will of course have a positive impact on, on the gaming industry. I think that we will see uh, several companies doing IPOs, among them probably Applavin, uh, Roblox, TinyBuild, and uh, huge games, uh, Playticker, uh, either at the end of this year or beginning next. So it will be still a hot market. Uh, I think that starting from this year, a lot of, a lot of uh, institutional investors have seen that the gaming market is actually very interesting with a very high returns. And seems like a, a market where you have guys like Deconstructor Fun, like Ariam, uh, you know, like uh, elite game developers and uh, other guys like Master Demeter, for example, uh, which do understand the gaming and which can, uh, you know, help you with executing these strategies, yes, uh, in, in this gaming space. So probably we will increase the transparency and provide more and more information to the, to, to the uh, guys with huge pockets around the globe, what is gaming and how you can make some predictions and how you can assess the company, whether it is good, bad, or how to deploy your strategy and how to, you know, actually make money make a lot of money uh, on your transactions. So eventually, I think that, um, yeah, a- anyway, the industry will evolve. Uh, it's the new generation of consoles that uh, is, you know, is about to happen, which will, of course, boost a lot of interest from around the globe, from, from the audience, uh, not only the one which, we, which is, you know, playing hardcore games, but we also have seen that hyper-casual space has evolved significantly over the last years and attracted more and more people into the gaming. So yeah, I think that uh, eventually we are uh, on the wave of uh, you know increasing capital inflow I- I into the gaming. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. There's two questions here that I want to ask from from the audience before we wrap it up. So the the recording will be live later on. Uh, I'll share the link to everybody who was on the, on the panel, and we're going to be sharing it on social media as well. But the first question here is. Do you think that the higher frequency of massive M&A deals will have an impact on the small fish M&A activities going forward? Or do you think we might see a synergy between the two with big deals attracting, attracting smaller investors and M&As? Who wants to take that? I think on the one side, you have more VC funds. So you have more opportunities to you know, bring the money into the company at the very high valuations, yes, right now. So, I mean, like you can attract plenty a lot of money and staying independent until you grow to a very large stage. That's on the one side that you have. But on the other side, uh, the market, the competition within the market is increasing, yes, uh, like <laughs> almost each year, I would say almost each quarter, yes. So you have more and more, I would say powerhouses like Steelfront, yes, which consolidates certain genres, 
and which evolves significantly within particular, I would say, subgenre and has a lot of expertise there. So it's getting harder to compete within the certain genres until you uh, create something new for the market and you, you have your own audience. Uh, so, yeah, answering that question, I would say that on, that, on the one hand, you have VCs uh, more, putting more and more money into the independent companies. On the other hand, you have more and more strategics, which can bring you a lot of expertise and money and scale your business. And they know how or the way how to do it. And you, you still will be independent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the choice for everyone uh, within the seller, I think, to select what they would love to have at the end of the day. So either they want to, you know, to secure their right and become very, you know, have a very rapid growth uh, from the very beginning, like Deuscraft, for, ex uh, for example, has done, yes. So they, they, uh, they started, uh, you know, like scaling the game very fast and, uh, you know, joined forces with a very huge international gaming brand like My Games. Or either you want to stay independent for some time and to scale to some, I would say, uh, some other, um, I don't know, like scale like revenue, and then you go M&A. So that, that's my point of view. Yeah. Well, what I would add here is uh, so, so acquiring a company, small or large, is actually pretty much the same amount of work, like in terms of making it happen. Uh, so it might be actually sometimes it's more complicated for, for smaller ones. So, so m most buyers will, as the industry grows, will kind of be more focused on things that are kind of moving the needle for them uh, and have a, a bigger impact. Um, however, uh, so, so that's why I think, uh, and, and I think you, it's, uh, it's breaking into, you know, past sort of 30, 50 million of annual run rates is, is something very different from, you know, going from like two to five. So, so there is always a premium for, for scale. I think, uh, they, there are people who are, uh, looking at, at the smaller things and are, are able to, uh, kind of roll up their sleeves and, uh, really add value, fix things, improve things and, uh, and create value through that. You have people who are trying to, to build, you know, like mini skill fronts, like, like Phoenix games, uh, in Germany, um, class there is doing an, an, a great job as, at, at finding kind of slightly smaller targets, uh, than the, the public guys. So, um, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, well, big, big deals happening is, is always helpful. Uh, but it's a, it's a slightly different market and it's probably um, things are still moving into kind of uh, more focused on, on, on larger M&A. Mm. Hey, thanks everybody. I think we're going to be re wrapping it up now. The recording will be live later on so you can check it out. Uh, so thanks again to everybody on the panel and go check out investgame.net for the data yeah, that we shared today. I'm just going to drop the link to the report which has been shown today in the chat. So I hope everybody sees that. Okay. All right, guys. Have a good day. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. You too. Thank Bye. you guys so much. Bye.